Controversial radio and TV host Glenn Beck spends most of his time on air talking about ways to change the country. Well, now he is opening up about the darkest moments in his life and how he finally found a path to success. It is all in his new book with psychiatrist Dr. Keith Ablo called The Seven, Seven Wonders That Will Change Your Life. Glenn Beck and Dr. Keith Ablo, nice to see and you both. First you. time on the Today Show, so Yes, welcome. it is. Thank you. You know, this is a self-help book. It is not a book about politics, but you say that... It could help change this country. So I think, what was the goal in writing the book? I think that, um, actually, it started with Keith and I just having a conversation as two friends. And he said, how did you get from down in a fetal position on the floor to where you are now? And we had this conversation. And, um, you know, it started with me trying to find the answer to how we fix our country. And we fix our country by fixing ourselves. It, it's... It's not going to be fixed in Washington. It starts with the individual. It has to. It has to. Unless we um, fix ourselves, we, we go the way of the French, not the Americans. And even Thomas Jefferson and, uh, and Thomas Paine missed that in the revolutions. We had uh, successful, they ended in horrible bloodshed. And it's because the people were different. And what the people were here in America were decent and they were connected to themselves and the things that were real. If we don't have that connection, we're going to spiral out of control. Speaking about individuals, let's talk about this individual. This yes. is a controversial guy. He's got a lot of buddies, got a lot of enemies out there. Did you have any <laughs> second thoughts Who are my buddies? about collaborating? You? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you got yeah, one here. I got one. This, that's all it takes. Uh, I had no but second thoughts. Yeah. I had no second thoughts, and, I, and I'm pleased that my instincts were as good Why in this case. Why didn't you? Because he's a lightning rod. Because when I was on his show, Back at CNN when we first met, I was amazed by how willing he was to come forward with his pain and what he had been through. And that's what began our discussion. That's where this book really started, where I thought to myself, how did you get to be so self-revealing? And why does it match what I know about the way that people get well? You have to, you have to surrender. You know, I don't even know what his political views are, and we're friends. I don't really care. He's a decent guy. Um, he conducts himself with honor and integrity. And that's and, good enough for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I got the same kind of heat when I was over at CNN, and I was, you know, I was taking on the Bush administration. You know, in this book, you talk about, I mean, talk about being in the depths of despair, depression. Your mom committed suicide when you were a teenager. Yeah. You dealt with those issues yourself as an adult, uh, mm -hmm. suicidal thoughts, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, trouble holding down a job. You sounded like kind of a nasty <laughs> guy Other for than a that, long time. Oh, I was. Yeah. Oh, I was a, I was a guy... Um, um, that uh, I would have hated. Um, I don't know why anybody uh, stuck around, and most of them didn't in the end. I was a very bad man. But you say these seven steps, the, the, they turned your life around. What makes you so confident that it w would work for anybody? Um, because they're universal principles. They're, they're courage, the courage to be able to look at the situation, look at, look at the things around you and say, okay, I don't want to believe these things about me or the country or whatever. I don't want to believe them. But... I better look at them. Courage, faith, um, friendship, family. They're Truth, all... compassion. Yeah. And how to use them. Because one of the things that we arrived at together is don't wait for a, a clean runway, a clear runway for courage. Courage doesn't, uh, it's not pure. It keeps company with fear and with doubt. If you can focus on that and say, of course I'm afraid. Yeah, I have doubts, but I'm going to take one step. When Glenn stood up off of a shag carpet, not his choice, it was in the apartment when he rented Olive it. Olive Green, yeah. it was a nice Olive apartment. Green. Back in 1996, yeah. right. <laughs> and decided he wasn't going to die. One of the key things he told me is, you know what, when I stood up, I didn't feel any better. And it's very important. I even use that with my patients. Don't expect you're going to feel better right away. Right, it's a journey. I want to talk about it, one of the chapters in your book. It's titled, Isn't There Anyone to Hate? And you write, quote, defeat anger, stop using it as a shield against truth, and you will find the compassion you need to forgive the people you love. There's been a lot of discussion recently about anger in our political mm -hmm. discourse. Do you believe the same compassion could apply there? Absolutely. I, I tell you, it is the hardest. That is the hardest one. For me, that was the hardest one um, um, in my own personal life. Um, especially people who were injuring you and continually injuring you. Um, it takes a lot to let go. But you'll find a time where all of a sudden you start to feel sorrow for them. I mean, somebody who I was really angry with for a long period of life, um, I, 
I actually started to feel sorry for them. I remember it, it was a, a point where I drove away yeah. with my wife, and I, I wept because I'm like, what happened to them? <laughs> that, and that was a shock to me. But, you know, you, you talk about spewing anger in your personal life, but also in your professional life, Glenn. I mean, there are people uh, who've uh, criticized you and said that you're, you're part of the problem. Oh, I know. In terms of well, anger. You know Let me just finish the thought. I have people thought. in my office who tell me that, too, by the way, Mer Meredith. I think that there's a, a corollary, a parallel here. If you're the therapist for a country, you have to tell the truth. And it can but there's a difference kind of set the people truth. back on their heels. Yeah, you're an alcoholic, right. I say to someone. He says to the country, you're drunk. But, he, but you say more than that. You've said things like, and this is, I guess, where the critics come into play and say that you've added to this dialogue of hatred. That Aaron, I can tell you right now. That Let me just finish the thought, okay? Yeah, Some ahead. things that go you ahead. said in the past, just to get them out there. And you know this. <laughs> you, that the, you, the you really, wait, wait. Do you really think that people don't know the things that I say? I think some people do, some people don't. A lot okay. of people do. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm ticking right. off a couple of them that the president was a racist. You, you said at one point you were joking around that you wanted to poison Nancy Pelosi. You wanted to beat Congressman Charlie Rangel to death with a shovel. In the spirit of this book. Like eight years ago. In the, that doesn't matter. No, it's no. in the past. I understand I, that. But in the spirit of this book, do you regret that stuff now? Having gone I through regret this process, anything you know that I said. That any, was dumb. Let me, let me give you this. Anything that I said in jokes, no. Ask John Stewart. Ask The Simpsons. Okay. You don't um, think that that contributes at all to a climate of anger no, I or think, hate? No. Ask John Stewart that question. Ask The I'm Simpsons. I'm asking you that question. Uh, yeah. uh, but I'm saying if you ask that question to those guys, I think you'll get the same answer. No, comedy is comedy when there is, and this is why the lines become very blurred and it's very, it's very difficult to do what I do. Anything that I've said, um, uh, like with the president, I have already apologized for and I've explained several times. Um, that's so not where we... That, have you shifted your lines at all? No. You know, one thing that the media doesn't seem to pick up on is when I started the 912 Project, what was it? It was about honor. I mean, it was the, the line's been the same: honoring your principles, principles and, values. and values. It wasn't the Tea Party. Nine Twelve Project, which I started, was okay. Find out what you believe. Educate yourself. Go into your principles and values, and make sure those principles and values are there to guide you. Eight Twenty Eight. Everyone said it was going to be a hate fest. That I was just going to be a monster. And, and, say, and what was it? It was about honor. There wasn't a word of politics. But let me just say, again, and because this book is about finding your truth. And, and owning it, do you feel, do you look back over what you've done and say, yeah, I've, uh, there are places absolutely. where I've crossed the line and absolutely. I have to readjust a, the way, my discourse? Absolutely. You're not human if you don't look back and say, that was a mistake, that was a mistake. Like I what? What are the mistakes back, you've made that you think that you'd say, geez, I wish I hadn't done that? Let me, let me answer it this way. Back, we, we have such an interesting view of history. Political discourse is sometimes really in your face. Telling somebody that you've got a real problem, sometimes you really get into their face. You have to. Just like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams went back and forth. John Adams was called a hermaphrodite by um, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Adams responded and said, Jefferson, your children will be raped and your towns will be burned if he becomes a president. Let's keep political discourse in context of history children weren't raped nobody killed each other we have to fix the individual the problem in tucson was the individual let's look at the individual and be responsible for ourselves so the controversy around sarah palin and this when she used that term blood libel uh, what are your feelings about that I, I think i think again political discourse is dicey sometimes people don't like it um, when the president said, um, what was it he said, uh, if the Republicans bring a knife, I'm going to bring a gun. That, did he mean that? Or was that political discourse? He didn't mean that. Let, let's put things in perspective. Let's stop dancing around the corners and, and, and looking at Republicans and Democrats. And let's start to find real answers. And the real answers are the, uh, are the principles that you'll find in this book that will change you. Just change yourself. Don't There's worry about anybody else. We want to talk to change you guys you. about. I know you're going to be coming back to you talk a little bit more. Thank you so much you for bet. joining us this morning. Thanks, Thank you as well.